Welcome back to this edition of Arlington Public News. I'm Michelle Marino. And I'm Paul Whirlin. In tonight's newscast, we bring you a report about safety on the Minuteman bike path. We discuss Arlington's 2014 Green Grant, and we speak with a volunteer and participant in the Alzheimer's Walk. Plus, we announce our next Photo of the Month contest. All this and much more coming up next. Please stay with us. The Arlington Police Department received full state accreditation status from the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission on October 2nd. Massachusetts is one of 24 states that offer an accreditation process for their police departments. Arlington is one of only 45 municipal police departments in the state to achieve full accreditation. Uh, the Arlington Police Department um, has sought, and um, I'm happy and proud to report tonight, received full accreditation for the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission for the first time in the history of the Arlington Police Department. You know, accreditation is, you know, we had to comply with over 325 national uh, law enforcement standards as promulgated by the National Commission for Law Enforcement on Accreditation. You know, we could, we could write policy and stick it on a shelf, but you're not going to get accredited if you write policy and stick it on a shelf. The, the subject matter experts and the, uh, the assessors came out last spring and spent a week at the Arlington Police Department observing our activities, looking at our policies and procedures, and essentially uh, they wrote a report card to the Accreditation Commission, and I'm happy to tell you that your police department got an A+. How safe is it to bike, walk, or rollerblade on the Minuteman bike path? To find out, APN contacted the police departments that patrol the popular path that runs from Cambridge through Arlington and Lexington, ending in Bedford. I'm James Milan, and I'm joined this morning by Arlington Police Captain Jim Curran, who has kindly uh, offered to come in and speak to us today about the issue of bike safety, or sorry, safety generally on the Minuteman bike path, and specifically in response to several incidents of armed robbery uh, that we have reported over the last number of months. So Captain Curran, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Thanks for having us. Um, I wanted just to ask to, to, to begin with if you could describe a little bit about the, the series of incidents I was just referring to. Um, is there, can you tell us something about the, the frequency, um, for instance, of these armed robberies? We had uh, four armed robberies, three out of the four I believe were in August. And so that was within four incidents within a month or so? Yes. And is yeah. that usual, unusual? It is unusual. Well, the situations involved usually young males who happen to get isolated. I think two of our victims were 24 years old, were probably the oldest. And um, situations where I think three out of the four robberies involved being on the bike path after hours, which is between nine and five. How many assailants? Um, are these usually single assailants? Can they be multiple assailants in these incidents? In almost all of them, there's been at least two. We had one down by Thorndike Field as a gentleman was getting off the tee from college, from school. He got isolated and there were two masked assailants. I believe one of them had a, a four-inch blade. Yeah, uh, I was also going to ask, are, are there uh, weapons typically being used in these incidents or is there a whole range of, of, of arms being wielded? Usually, in, in two out of the four, they were alleged to have a knife. The other times, you know, it's intimidation, mm -hmm. or, or, or they get sneaky. What, what has been the response of the Arlington Police Department to these incidents? Well, I can proudly say we've got a young, aggressive department. Most of our officers have grown up in Arlington, you know, and, and they really take a great deal of pride in what they do. And uh, uh, the chief really uh, he actually stunned me. He's really big on, 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 on getting our officers out there into the public. And so he in, invested a lot of uh, uh, time and effort making sure that we had got our officers cobweb trained, which is specialized training for bike officers. Mm -hmm. We just had a, a 10 officers go through that training. Um, and needless to say, when stuff like this happens, uh, people out there might not know, but they could be riding a bike right next to an officer. The bike path spans four different communities beginning in, 
in, in Cambridge and Somerville area, and, um, and then moving through Arlington, Lexington, Bedford. Wondering whether you know about uh, whether there's similar rate of incidents uh, at other, uh, in the other communities. What, what can you tell us, if anything, about, about the other communities? Well, I can say Lexington obviously had, had at least one because the same suspect um, that we charged was involved in, in one in Lexington. We're fortunate enough we have a woman by the name of Danielle Smith who's a crime analysis person. She does an unbelievable job. We're fortunate to have her. She came from the Fusion Center, which is the state police version of crime analysis, and she knows the stuff inside out. In fact, she prepared me all this material for today. And because um, we're, we're, we're trying to get to the point where we can almost forecast where we think something's going to happen and be there. And um, because we're, we're trying to get to the point where we can almost forecast where we think something's going to happen and be there. And that's the way of the future. Well, thanks very much. All right. Thank you. And thank you for joining us uh, for Arlington Public News. I'm James Milan. You know, Michelle, I read that the Minuteman bike path is the second most popular bike path in the entire country that, that has been uh, converted from a, a railway bed. So. We know how popular it is if it's the most second, second most <laughs> used one in the entire country. Absolutely. I believe it. And uh, it's such a valuable asset to the community, really. Um, not only can you exercise, but you can commute to and from work and home. So uh, it's really great. It really is. Our next piece is the first in a series that will track the progress of Arlington's 2014 Green Grant. In this segment, we speak with town manager Adam Chapdelaine about what a Green Grant is, what it will be used for this year, and how it benefits Arlington. Hello, I'm Gayatri Sundarajan here with the town manager, Adam Chapdelaine, to talk about Arlington's 2014 Green Grant. So what is a Green Grant? The state started something called the Green Communities Division, I guess uh, almost five years ago now. Uh, so in 2010, Arlington applied to become a green community, and there's five different criteria a community has to go through to become a green community. Uh, but once you become a green community, then you're eligible to apply for green community grants. So what it is is the state putting aside a pot of money that com uh, communities can apply for to help implement energy, effic uh, energy efficiency initiatives in the town or city. And so how, what were the criteria for us to become a green community? So we had to agree to buy fuel efficient vehicles, which we did. We had to adopt the stretch energy code, which we did, and that's a, a code that governs how people uh, do building and different kinds of construction in their house. Uh, we had to allow for zoning for either research and development or siting of renewable energy. We had to commit to a 20% reduction in energy use, and we also had to commit to allowing uh, zoning for uh, on-site renewable energy as well. So we met all five of those criteria and became a green community in 2010. And so was this the first time we've got a green grant? It's actually the third time we've got a green grant. Uh, in the first year, we got a grant for $200,000 when we became a green community, and that wasn't competitive. That was everybody who became a green community got a set amount based on your population. Then in 2012, we get a second grant, which was a competitive grant, for $250,000, which we applied for, put together an application, and were, uh, was awarded. And then this year, we applied for this a uh, third competitive or second competitive third total grant uh, for just shy of $250,000 and we were awarded the full amount that we asked for. Wow, so what is this money going to be used for this year? So it's mainly going to go towards projects at the Otteson Middle School and Arlington High School. <clears throat> and actually almost all of it's at Otteson Middle School. Uh, it's going to help with uh, new boilers that are more energy efficient, uh, rooftop units that provide heating and cooling that are more efficient, uh, controls for the walk-in freezer that save energy, uh, cooling units uh, or air handling units in each classroom to operate more efficiently, uh, efficiently and also something called direct uh, demand control ventilation uh, in the auditorium, uh, in the cafeteria, which will regulate how much fresh air comes in and out based on how many uh, students or people are in the building. So why is it important that Arlington's going to become energy efficient or more? So I think there's really two main reasons why it's important. One's financial uh, and one's from just a commitment to reducing your carbon emissions. So through this grant, we project to save $86,000 a year in energy costs. But we also 
are going to reduce our carbon emissions by a requisite amount by reducing the amount of electricity and gas that we use to heat and cool the, uh, the buildings. And we're going to be doing it smarter. We're going to be using control systems, management systems, so that we're not heating spaces or cooling spaces that don't need to be heated or cooled. Uh, so there's, there's two main reasons. You know, some might just look at the taxpayer bottom line. Some might look at just the carbons emi uh, carbon emissions. Some might look at both. So there's really two good reasons. Well, thank you so much for joining me in the studio today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So this is Gayatri Sundarajan on behalf of the town manager reporting for Arlington Public News. Alzheimer's is a dreaded disease for which there is no cure. APN spoke to a volunteer and participant in the annual Alzheimer's Association Walk about her reasons for walking and about the services the association offers. Hi and welcome. Today I'm here with Olivia Flatus, who is the PR chair for the Greater Boston Walk to End Alzheimer's Committee. There was just a walk that took place on September 28th um, on a Sunday. So we're here to talk a little bit about it. Thank you so much for joining me, Olivia. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, so I really just want to start at the beginning and ask you, why do you walk? Why is this organization important to you? Well, my grandmother had Alzheimer's. Um, I don't, she was diagnosed when I was little, I was like 10, and then it just got progressively worse. So I saw the disease go from just her being like a normal person right. and then carried out to the end. I mean, she died from it. And I just kind of saw the toll it had on my dad. And I would say out of everyone in the family, he's probably the most like affected by it. Yeah. Um, she died about, it'll be almost 10 years. So she died eight years ago. So the walk that happened this year, would you quantify it as a success? Did you, I know people obviously raise money, did you reach your goal? As for the walk, we have definitely reached it. We're ex uh, it's expected to be exceeded. Our goal this year was a million, and we already broke a million on Convio, which is the t online system we use. Right. Where the participants go and sign up, they can send out um, emails and notifications for donations. Mm -hmm. So all the money is collected like the day of the walk. Okay. And I think they send out an email on Monday saying that we reached a million on there and we we're the first walk to do it. So, no yeah, it was pretty exci exciting to get the email. I was like, oh, my God, because I was like, la last year, I was like, I want to be the first. Right. Like, next year, we have to be, <laughs> we have to be Right. You're setting the bar high for yourself, like, not to worry about everyone else. What does all this money go to, specifically? It goes to research. It goes to all of the resources that we offer. We offer... Um, support groups. We offer a 24-hour hotline where um, caregivers can call. If you just need to vent to someone for a couple minutes, you can call them and they're there 24 hours. Um, so yeah, it all goes back to that. So it all goes back to the, the association, but it doesn't go to the staff. It goes to the, um, the people who are actually being affected by the disease. Right. And if someone's interested in volunteering, do they have to go to Watertown or are they able to sign up online? We also have offices throughout Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So you can go on the website and see where your closest office is. But um, we offer many different volunteering um, opportunities. You can come be on the committee or you can do the weekly phone banks. Um, we have different events throughout the year that people can volunteer at. So there's, um, there's definitely a wide variety of things that you can do if you're interested. Well, thank you so much for coming in and speaking with me about thank it. Thank you for I really having me. I appreciate it. I'm Hannah Perlmutter for Arlington Public News. Thank you for watching. You know, Paul, I think the walk is a great way to raise awareness and funds for finding a cure. It is, and the Alzheimer Association is really making great strides toward finding a cure, which is, of course, beneficial for everybody. Local musician Brad Delp of the band Boston was honored on October 5th at the Regent Theater. His friends and family gathered to play music and pay respects to the late lead singer and raise money for the Brad Delp Foundation, which supports music programs in schools. The night also doubled as a record release party for previously unheard tracks recorded by Delp. APN attended the event and brings you this report. On October 5th, the Regent Theatre hosted a record release party and concert for the Brad Delp Foundation. The night included an all-star lineup of Delp's friends and collaborators. Tonight is a uh, both a uh, benefit and fundraiser concert for the Brad Delp Foundation and also a record release party. Uh, we actually have a vinyl single picture sleeve of two unreleased songs that Brad Delp uh, recorded but were actually kind of found 
uh, cassette tapes that were thought lost and are only coming to light now. Uh, and Brad Delp, of course, was the lead singer of the band Boston. Uh, and but his real one of his real passions was singing the Beatles and the Beatles and Beetlejuice is one of the bands playing here tonight, and it's just been a great experience to um, help both with the issue of this uh, record and also to bring all of Brad's fa friends from different bands he's performed with over the years to do a live concert on our stage. So what is the foundation benefit? Was they are uh, are uh, bringing music uh, education back into the schools where a lot of the uh, school systems are taking them away and they work uh, closely with people who are trying to get music funding and bring music lessons and instruments and, and, and uh, things of that ilk. So it's all about the music. The Brad Delp Foundation was started in 2007 by Brad's friends and family to keep his memory alive as well as keep his spirit of charitable giving and his generosity uh, ongoing after his untimely passing. The night was a beautiful tribute to a local artist. For more information, go to braddeltfoundation.org. Our movie reviewer, Krista Benedictus, has been busy gathering staff recommendations for Halloween movies. He's here to present some of their spooky flick picks in the first of two installments. Hello, and happy Halloween. I'm Christy Benedictus, and welcome to my first of a two-part series on scary movies. Part one focuses on the suspense genre as a sort of primer for myself and the viewer. I want the transition into the bowels of Hera to be as painless for everyone, so I've started off light with the Disney film Hocus Pocus. The film follows the Sanderson sisters, three witches who desire eternal youth and can only obtain it by sucking the souls out of children. Talking cats, flying broom chases, bad Halloween jokes, musical numbers, this one has it all and is by no means scary. If I were to bust out the scareometer on this one, it would be at a one out of 10. Next, I watched a 1965 Roman Polanski film, Repulsion, suggested by ACMI executive director, Norm MacLeod. A thriller about a beautician gone crazy. I'm really not sure what was going on in this one. I loved it though. Super weird in all the right ways, Repulsion delves into this woman's troubled mind as she descends slowly into madness, repulsed by the world she inhabits. Four out of 10 on the scareometer, and for me, the scariest movie in part one. Jonathan Barbato suggested the 1990 classic Stephen King adaptation, Misery, starring James Caan and Kathy Bates. This is a really fun one. Bates plays Annie Wilkes, number one fan of best-selling author Paul Sheldon, Khan's character, who finds Sheldon after he crashes his car and nurses him back to health. But Annie Wilkes is his number one fan and will never let him leave. Bates won an Oscar for her performance and she deserved it, delivering one of the most chilling performances ever. Three out of 10 on the scareometer, but check it out for Bates' performance alone. Lastly, for this segment, I watched Hannah Perlmutter's suggestion, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Setting the bar for all horror to come, Hitchcock creates one of the most unforgettable scenes, sounds, and characters of all time. The shower scene is one of the most easily recognizable scenes in movie history, with the accompanying musical score perhaps more recognizable, sending chills down people's spines for the past 50 years. And Norman Bates is the classic psychopath serial killer, paving the way for Freddy, Jason, Hannibal, and all others. Four out of 10 on the scareometer, but it's a classic, so you should probably see it. That's it for part one. Next time I will delve deeper, watching films, films that were created for the purpose of scaring the viewer. I'm Krista Benedictus, see you next time. Up next is our arts and entertainment calendar. The hilarious Avenue Q comes to Arlington Friends of the Drama for three weekends only, October 17th through November 2nd. Get your tickets at afdtheater.org. See the work of over 80 local artists and artisans at Arlington Center for the Arts Open Studios October 18th and 19th. Join David Whitford for a conversation with Ambassador R. Nicholas Burns about American foreign relations on October 23rd. 
13 Forest Gallery hosts an opening reception for Broadside on October 24th. Eleven artists exhibit their reinterpretations of this outdated mode of communication. Arlington Historical Society kicks off its program season, Women's Work, on October 28th with a look at what it meant to be a working-class woman prior to the Revolutionary War. Don't miss the fourth annual Arlington International Film Festival, October 15th through 19th at The Regent. Get your tickets at regenttheater.com. Also at The Regent, on October 26th, The Wait and comedian Mike Pryor play a benefit for the Arlington Food Pantry. Support the Arlington Food Pantry and get your tickets at regenttheater.com. You know, Michelle, I was fortunate enough enough to see Avenue Q on Broadway when it first came out. Have you seen it? I have not. That would have been a, an amazing experience, but we get to see it here in town, so uh, I guess just as good. Are you going to go? I'm definitely going <laughs> to go. I want to go. I want to go. Absolutely. And I think also give a little shout out to Chris, too, on his Halloween picks and reviews, and you better stick around for the next installment. Absolutely. Our Photo of the Month contest is back. This month's festive theme is Fall Fun. Submit your pictures on our Facebook page or email them to news at acmi.tv for a chance to win a $50 gift certificate to Prime, your local butcher. The deadline is November 5th. We look forward to seeing all of your entries. Well, Paul, I am very much looking forward to this photo of the month contest because it's fall, and fall in New England means pumpkin everything and foliage, so I bet these submissions will be great. I think they'll be terrific, so don't be shy, folks. Please get your entries into us. We'd love to see them. Thank you for joining us this week as we present issues of interest to Arlington and surrounding communities. Check out our latest segments on the web at news.acmi.tv, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Please join us next time for another edition of Arlington Public News. I'm Paul Whelan. And I'm Michelle Marino. See you next time.